Welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to take a look at uh, the different kinds of systems models that can be built. Uh, we have kind of already seen the different phases of the software engineering life cycle and uh, this is an introductory section into what the different phases uh, will entail as far as the details are concerned. Uh, but essentially this talk is going to focus primarily on the different kinds of models that can be built that can be used to communicate. Uh, be, uh, that can be ser that can serve as a communication medium between the analyst, the systems analyst, and the customers, the systems analysts, and the designers, and so on. Uh, there are different kinds of models, and uh, we are going to get into uh, the details of some of those models. But uh, primarily, this lecture is meant to serve as a high-level introduction to the different kinds of models, and uh, we will get into uh, the detail of each one of these during the discussion of the phases of the software engineering life cycles. Um, so, what is systems modeling exactly and why is it required is the question that we would ask ourselves at the beginning. And the, the systems models uh, just as a way that formal specifications can and requirements engineering documents can uh, will help the analyst to understand the requirements of the system, the functionality of the system that therefore has to be built based on these requirements. And uh, then the models can also be used to communicate with the different customers. Right? Um, so, there, there can be uh, different types of users of the system and the models, uh, you know, the external models for example can be used to communicate with some of the users of the system. Now, there are uh, various kinds of bases, there, there are three bases along which these models can be constructed. And the first uh, basis is the external perspective. This is a model that will show how the system that is being built is likely to interact with other systems of the context in which the system is likely to function. An example of an external perspective could be that you are building an ERP system for the business, the enterprise resource planning system for the business and the ERP system in turn would have to interact with a financials package, it would have to interact with a data source that uh, allows uh, the data to be fed into the system. Uh, etc. So, this is not part of the system functionality per se, but these models serve to illustrate how the system that is going to be built is going to end up interacting with other systems in its context. The second type of uh, models that can be constructed are what are called behavioral models and behavioral models essentially try to uh, which show the behavioral perspective that shows the 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 way the system is going to react to certain stimuli, the way the system is going to have a state diagram associated with it. The re so, so, it is basically the reaction of the system to external stimuli. And finally, the structural perspective or structural models are essentially concerned with showing uh, what the different data architectures of the system are likely to look like, uh, functional breakup of the system's modules or so modularization of the system itself as far as uh, you know what are the different modules it is composed of and how they can be put together in order to form the system functionality. So, the models cover the range of uh, the inside of the system as is going to be seen through the eyes of an analyst at, at the very beginning of the process all the way through to uh, what are the different uh, contextual surroundings that the system is going to end up interacting with. So, there are again uh, the different types amongst the high level categories that we have considered the structural, the behavioral and the, the contextual or the external perspectives there are different kinds of models that can, that can be constructed. You know data processing models for example or DFT diagrams as they are known popularly uh, show how the data is put together, what is the structure of the data, the data dictionary is also form a part of the data processing model. Um, architectural models on the other hand essentially have to do with the principal subsystems uh, as is divided log as the system is divided into logically. And uh, then there can be stimulus response models or state transition diagrams as uh, if you will that will show what this, how the system reacts to different external events and so on and so forth and we will get into the details of each one of these models as we go through the presentation. Now, what is the use of a contextual model or uh, the external perspective? Why is it useful to take an external perspective first of all? So, these are used to essentially illustrate uh, the operational context of a system. By this, we mean that we are trying to differentiate what the boundary of the system is from that that lies just outside the boundary. So, we are trying to scope out the system in saying that given a particular system's requirements, this is where the boundary lies and anything that lies outside of this. So, for example, the ERP system that we considered earlier, uh, you, could, uh, you could say that 
anything that has to do with processing the inventory for example is part of the ERP system anything that do has to do with putting things into the inventory system taking things out of the inventory system and so on. But anything that has to do with cost, costing, accounting, uh, the purchasing, the logistics of purchasing and so on do not fall into this system. So, they, they form part of the external context within which the system operates. And uh, so, there may be certain social and organizational concerns uh, that may actually help decide as to where to position the system boundaries. Um, so, for example, if the accounting department wants to keep their systems entirely separate, then that may be a decision factor into what, where the system boundary for the ERP system or the logistics planning system may lie. Um, and then uh, the different models that can be constructed here will also show the relationship um, of, of the contextual models with the various other uh, systems that may exist within the environment. So, here is an example of an ATM uh, system or automatic teller machine system that is being constructed and the auto teller system is the one that exists at the, uh, at the center of the figure um, as is being indicated by the mouse and here are all the various other systems that this ends up interacting with. Now, the thing to be noted here is the things like the branch accounting system, the security system, the accounting database and so on are not subsystems of the auto teller system. So, in that sense it is not an architectural diagram. Right. What, what this is, is that uh, it, it is showing the other external systems. For example, the security system may be common with not just the auto teller system, but all the other um, systems that may exist within the banking institution. So, for example, a physical teller logging into his or her console may also end up dealing with the uh, security system. Uh, same thing is the account database. The account database obviously is something that is common to pretty much all aspects of the bank. Um, and that is shared by various other systems. So, what, what this kind of a diagram or a contextual model serves to do is to position the system that is going to be built, which in this case is going to be the auto teller system um, in, uh, in relation to the other systems that this is going to end up interacting with um, during the course of its lifetime. So, uh, having talked a little bit about contextual models, we would not go very much deeper into that. It is mainly a high level modeling technique that is used to just position the boundaries of the system, so that we know exactly um, where to cut it off in terms of if, if we have a doubt or an ambiguity in the requirements as to whether we should be modeling for example, security, we should be uh, focusing on building a security system. This clearly shows that a, a system such as the security system or the accounting subsystem is going to be outside the bounds of the auto teller system. In, in in this particular example. Now, uh, process models on the other hand uh, basically show the overall business processes that are supported by the system. Right? What do we mean by business process? Uh, business process is essentially something that outlines the series of actions that may be taken on a um, uh, relating to a particular business operation. So, for example, processing an order uh, within a company uh, that is manufacturing any kind of device a customer order comes in and there has to be a certain business process that is associated with processing that order before the equipment or whatever has been ordered is going to get shipped out to the customer. Um, so, th those are what are called process models and we will take a more detailed look at uh, 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 example of a process model which is an equipment uh, procurement process and see how that flows. Um, along with the process model can also exist data flow models or DFT diagrams that can show off the flow of info. Here the focus is not so much on the movement of the uh, action, the, the movement of the control or the movement of the action, but the focus here is on how the data moves and how the data is transformed as it moves along the process from one process to another. So, let us first take a look at these two models. We are going to try and uh, write out an uh, example of a equipment procurement process as in this case. So, this is an example of a business pro process that occurs uh, commonly in most uh, say equipment manufacturing companies. So, there can exist first of all a couple of databases which this needs to operate off of. There can be the database of suppliers. Right. And there can also be the database which lists the type of equipment that is manufactured by the company. And a, a business process goes something like this, right. The first thing is we specify the kind of equipment that is required, specify with a C, sorry about that. 
um, and then the first step that often occurs in this is we may need to validate the specification. So this may be done by some kind of an analyst etc. And the, the list, the database of external suppliers that exist will be used to find a particular supplier So given the specification it can be, so what these arrows are trying to show and uh, see the, the boxes are essentially illustrating the different databases, there are two kinds of databases which is the suppliers and the equipment database and the different uh, ovals here are trying to indicate business process steps. The first step in the procurement of equipment is that you have to specify the specification of the equipment you want to procure. The next step is somebody has to validate that specification to say yep this is indeed what we want to get and at the same time this indicates that it can be done in parallel uh, two arrows going out of the same box. Uh, somebody can go find the list of suppliers that can supply the kind of equipment that we want to buy and eventually once it is validated and once we get the list of suppliers we can get cost estimates right. So we might put out. Uh, a, a request and at that point in time different people may end up bidding and different equipment suppliers may end up bidding so we end up getting cost estimates. Um, once we get the cost estimates we typically end up choosing a supplier which is another step in the business process and once a supplier is chosen we end up placing an order. Right. Once the uh, order has been placed, the delivery is taken, take delivery and once the equipment has been delivered, you enter it into your equipment database, right. Once the equipment has been delivered and accepted. So here is an example of a business process that uh, helps you during the requirements engineering phase actually communicate with the customer as to what is the system going to be doing. Right, the system in this case is being built to automate an equipment procurement process. There are certain data requirements of this which we have not really focused on in this case. We have primarily focused on the flow of control uh, that exists within the business process. Right, so all the way from the specification of the equipment that is to be purchased or procured all the way through to taking delivery of that equipment and then entering it into the equipment database or the inventory database that you might have within your company. Right. Uh, so these, uh, this is an example of a business process. So behavioral models on the other hand show how the system itself ends up uh, reacting to certain external stimuli. So what is the behavior of the system going to be like and uh, so this may uh, look something like a state transition diagram, it may be a data processing model or a DFD diagram and so on. So in fact there are two types of uh, behavioral models that we can consider data processing models is one of them and data processing models just like we saw the business process flow model or the process model, a data processing model here focuses on the, the movement of data from one system to another in the course of satisfying the exact same business process that we talked about. Um, and then on the other hand we can take a look at the inside of each module now and say what is how is the module, what are the different kinds of external stimuli this module is going to react to and for each external stimulus what, uh, what kind of reaction is it going to have, is it going to move to a different state etc. Et so uh, both of these perspectives are typically required because they, they show very different perspectives on the system's behavior and both of them are required and they go together uh, to form a good behavioral model. So uh, data processing models uh, are also called uh, data flow diagrams or DFT diagrams and they are used to model a system's data processing capabilities. Right? As we just talked about they show the flow of data uh, and the transformation of data as well. So data for example going from one step to another uh, the equipment specification in the previous procurement process that we saw might have the specification itself is a piece of data that now has to go to be validated uh, and once it is validated there may be certain changes that are done to that specification. Once is, that is done it is converted into some kind of an order form and so on and so forth. So there are different pieces of data that are being created, the data is being transformed 
uh, or changed along the business process and the data flow diagrams try to show the end to end processing of the data itself. Um, one thing to note is that the data flow diagram may also end up focusing on trying to show the flow of data between the uh, between the system that is being built as well as external systems that the system may end up accessing at the end of the day. So, we will take a look at an example of a data flow diagram for order processing. So, this is the flip side of what happens during the procurement process. In the equipment procurement business process that we saw there was a company that wanted to procure some kind of equipment and then went and placed an order with an external firm right. In this case in the data flow diagram we are going to take a look at what the uh, order processing flow is going to look like from the perspective of the data right. So, the first thing that happens is that um, and the order details come in right. This may be typically in the shape of a form that is given it may be a web form. So, the order details as the first piece of data that is received during the course of this process and once the order details are received there is a step that is done. Remember the uh, data flow diagram has to be in relation to the uh, to the business process that it is trying to serve right. So, uh, first thing that might be done is that the order might be completed. So, there may be certain details that may be coming in through different forms for example, the customer details might already be known in the database etcetera, etcetera. So, the order is completed in that sense and the output of this is a completed order or a validated order if you will right. Once this is done some approval may be required right once the approval is done what comes out of the approval process remember the focus is on the data flow the focus is on the order details the completed order and in the case of an approved order let us say it is a signed order form. Remember the form may not be a physical or paper entity it could easily be an electronic uh, uh, entity in fact it normally is in the case of systems. Uh, once a signed order form is gotten you end up normally recording the order and once you record the order. So, the next step may be that of record order and uh, typically a record order will put things into some kind of an order database right. So, I have just written DB for short, but it is putting some things into an order database then it will send it off to logistics. So, the record order the output of this is again simply the signed order we are not going to change the data in this case. So, the logistics output is then um, uh, the logistics process and the logistics itself may be a business process of taking the order that has been gotten and turning it into a shipping that is done back into the customer who placed the order in the first place. And uh, then this may end up uh, reacting with accounting and so on and so forth. Uh, so, the logistics process for example, uh, may have as an output accounting details that may end up feeding some kind of an accounting subsystem and so on and so forth. So, while we would not go into the details of the back end of the business process that this ends up dealing with what this is trying to illustrate is the different pieces of data flow that occurs within the system and I have marked these with little arrows here. But uh, what this is trying to show is initially the order details were gotten the order details are converted by this complete order step into a completed order form. The completed order form is again transformed or converted by this approval step to a signed order form and so on and so forth. So, here is a example of a DFD that can uh, illustrate uh, the, the purpose of creating a data flow diagram in the first place. Uh, we can take a look at another very quick uh, example of a DFD that also shows some uh, interaction with external systems or external stimuli. So, this is a blood sugar meter system a blood sugar meter system and here the input to such a system is typically a 
drop of blood right uh, and uh, which is being analyzed for the amount of sugar in the blood. This is fed to some kind of a sensor and uh, what the sensor does is it, it does performs a step of analysis typically some form of chemical analysis is done right and uh, so before the analysis is done typically the parameters are fed into the an analysis system. The sensor outputs a certain set of parameters saying here is the chemical composition of the blood that I am seeing, here, here are the different uh, uh, parameters that, that I am noticing. The analysis will then translate all those parameters into a blood sugar level is normally accessed, uh, expressed as uh, parts per uh, parts per million or something like that. Uh, this can then be uh, translated into in turn, I mean th this is the basic function of a blood sugar meter to convert it, uh, but this can also be uh, for example fed into an external system that does uh, say insulin computation. So, how much of insulin would be required in order to control the blood sugar because we know what the normal levels are like. So, it takes as input the blood sugar level that is currently being read from the patient and then it outputs amount of insulin to release amount of insulin to release and this amount of insulin to release is typically fed into some kind of an insulin pump. which is really an insulin device that releases a certain amount of insulin and so on. So, here is an example again of a data flow system, but something that focuses on interaction with external systems more than the data flow within this uh, the, the subsystem itself. The subsystem is pretty simple here, it just consists of two steps that of analysis and the insulin computation step and uh, the, the change in the data that is happening is first the parameters are gotten from the sensor. Once the parameters are gotten the blood sugar level is calculated and that is another piece of data that is created uh, and finally the insulin computation function will uh, output a third piece of data which is the amount of insulin and goes off to external systems. Um, so, DFTs do not don't necessarily focus on the flow of data within a subsystem or within the system that is being built, but can also uh, illustrate the interaction of these subsystems with external subsystems as well. So, uh, these are data flow diagrams uh, moving on what we we'll look at is the other aspect of behavioral models and the other aspect of behavioral models are state machine models. State machine models essentially try to illustrate uh, what the response of the system is going to be like uh, to external as well as internal events right. So, uh, it could be that you know if you take a microwave oven for example, an external event could be somebody turning the microwave oven on. Um, and uh, it responds in a certain way to that which is it, it turns on and it runs for the amount of time that it has been set to. An internal event could be something uh, such as a fuse uh, that, that goes off and uh, in, the fu in the fuse bursts or it goes off typically that comes to a halt and there is a response to that kind of an internal event as well. Or that could be a change in the data uh, of a system and the change in the data might trigger something for example, uh, a date right. So, when you are crossing over to the new millennium the behavior of the system could end up changing in some which way. Uh, so, the, uh, the state models are often concerned with showing the response of the system to stimuli and are uh, typically used for modeling real time systems, but they are also very useful in non real time systems as well. Um, and these models typically show the different states to be the nodes and the arcs between the nodes uh, essentially illustrate the different events that are occurring right and the state is the system is transitioning from one state to the other with it in response to the event that is occurring which is coming in as an arc to that particular state. Um, it is also expressed in a notation called UML and we will go into a little bit about UML uh, later in this talk. Uh, state uh, transition diagrams can often be complemented by tables that describe all the states and the stimuli. So, it can be a more detailed description as opposed to be a, a very formal concise notation uh, as well right. So, we will take a look at another example of a microwave oven model in this case. Uh, we will take a simplistic model we, uh, we would not go too far into this. So, this is a straight transition diagram.
and in the case of a microwave it can be in several different states right the the microwave can be in a let us say two different states it can be waiting it can be enabled it can be disabled to make it really simple we will say the, there are only four states to this or it can be running or operating right um, and we can we can certainly make this as detailed as we want it but we are going to take a fairly simplistic example now the microwave is the initial state of the microwave is typically the disabled state that is it is powered off or it has been disabled due to safety reasons and so on right so uh, the from the disabled state an event such as an enable event will move it to the enabled state that is what this is trying to show that these are different states the nodes of the states and the arcs between them illustrate the events to which they are uh, to which it ends up responding right. Similarly from an enabled state it can go back to a disabled state with a disable event right. Now once it is enabled it typically moves to a waiting state right waiting uh, in the sense that somebody has to typically program the microwave to run say you want to set it up for 60 minute I mean 60 seconds and you want it to run on high power or low power. So uh, once the microwave is enabled that is it has been unlocked so to speak it moves into the waiting state and from the waiting state it can essentially move to a running state when it is programmed let us say programmed and program in this case would uh, would essentially mean that somebody turned on the timer in a certain power level and once it is in the waiting state can be programmed going to the running state and once it finishes running it can come back into the waiting state right. This is a done event so for example the timer runs out could be a done event you had set it up for a minute or two minutes and the timer ran out at the end of 2 minutes and this would mean that it is finished running and therefore move back into a waiting state right. Um, now we could have for example avoided this enabled state and the, the disabled can directly make it go to the waiting state um, in which case the, the diagram would look something like um, it goes from disabled directly here for the enable event. Uh, it is not going to take this path and we can cut out the state entirely right or we can have an enabled state and we can say that setting the power is going to set power level right set power level is going to move it from the enabled state onto a waiting state with a certain power level. So the, the diagram can be made as complicated as we want it to be but essentially this should describe exactly the states that a microwave oven in this case. So this is that of a microwave oven operation is going to go through and this will often decide uh, uh, this will often help the designers decide as to what kind of interface we ought to lend this particular device right. For example there needs to be some kind of a digital interface to enable it there needs to be an interface to set the power levels for the microwave there needs to be an interface to uh, turn the microwave on stop the microwave and so on and so forth. So there can be again multiple events that transition it from one state to another it does not have to be a single event in this case uh, in going from running to waiting we have said that an event done which is when it completes or uh, the timer runs out it is going to wait it can also be that the user cancels the operation or stops the microwave in the middle. So for example you set it up to heat for a minute but 30 seconds later you decide that it, you know you think it is enough and therefore you cancel the operation. So there can be external events multiple external events that causes a state change and that, that can also be illustrated in this case. So uh, we remember we said that uh, this can often be supplemented with the help of tables that give a descriptive idea of uh, of what the state transition diagram is going to look like. Uh, here is an example of a table that shows the state description for a microwave. Um, in this case we did have an enabled and a disabled state and we have two different states called waiting on full power and waiting on half power 
right. So, you can for example, we said setting the power level, the setting the power level um, can be done in multiple ways and if you set it to full power, it goes on to waiting on full power. If you set it to half power, so it is going to cook on half power, it is going to go on to uh, waiting on half power. And uh, the rest of the states are pretty much what we talked about earlier. Uh, we can also describe all the stimuli in this diagram basically describe the states uh, that, uh, that existed and there was a description of each of the states. Here we are describing the events that cause a state transition, right. So, for example, half power is an event that, that illustrates that the user has set the microwave to run on half power um, and the timer set for example is an event that illustrates that the user has set the timer for 30 seconds for a minute or whatever, right. Uh, once you, you set the timer, you still have to provide a start event necessarily, uh, that would be a sensible way to set it up on the microwave and the start event in this case would uh, essentially indicate the microwave has to start operation, then there can be a cancel event, there can be a timer done event, um, etc., etc., different kinds of events that can exist. So, here notice that there can be external stimuli as well as internal stimuli. The external stimuli are things like start, cancel, half power, full power and so on. The internal stimuli could be things like door is open, door is closed, um, is been disabled, is been powered off and so on and so forth. So, there can be different uh, uh, stimulus here as well. Now, uh, this diagram primarily goes to indicate what the microwave operation looks like um, and this is kind of similar to a state transition diagram except that it is kind of very much operational in nature. Um, and uh, what this is trying to illustrate is that uh, you know when 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 you set it to cook, you, you set the time, then it cooks, then it's going to run. So there is some description uh, of an in, in an operational diagram of uh, what are the what are the different tasks that are done by each one of the steps within the microwave. So there is a cook module, and the cook module has a single function on it, which is run. And uh, when it runs, it basically you know turns the generator on and it cooks. Right, um, and it, when it is done, there has to be a certain action. Right, whenever uh, it goes into a done state, you have to turn the buzzer on. Typically, microwaves have some kind of a beep, uh, beeping mechanism which let you know that the operation is done. So you turn the buzzer on. So this is very much the operational diagram is also very much like a state transition diagram, except that it is augmented. And uh, th so these are not states, but these are functions. And these actually let you know as to what exactly is going to be done in this case. So, it is not a transition of the internal state that is happening, but um, it, it kind of lets us know that these are the different functions to be done. So, for example, if something went wrong with the microwave, uh, then there could be some kind of an alarm function or an alarm module within the microwave and it would kind of emit a uh, beep, it might display something on the display saying, you know, this is uh, this has gone wrong with the microwave um, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, there are three kinds of diagrams that really help us describe behavior if you will. Uh, one is an operational diagram, the, the last one that we saw in the case of the microwave example. Uh, one of them is a, uh, a data flow diagram and one of them is a process model, right um, and uh, state transition diagrams and so on. So, these actually help us illustrate uh, the, uh, the, the, the behavior of a particular device or a software module that is going to be built. So, having seen the behavioral models and the contextual models, we will now move on to the structural models that we talked about. Remember, there were three types of models, structural, behavioral and contextual um, or external representations and structural models essentially deal with how the system uh, ends up getting constructed. So, if you take a look at structural data models, uh, so th these do not illustrate the flow of data, but these illustrate what the structure of data is to be like. So, semantic data models are often called ER diagrams uh, uh, and these illustrate what the different entities in the system are and what is the relationship between these different entities. Uh, very widely used in database design, in fact even today the basis of system design often turns out to be ER modeling and the ER models are used to generate the database schema before uh, the, the system code itself ends up getting written. Um, there is no formal specific notation for ER modeling unfortunately, uh, but UML and uh, object modeling uh, and its associations can often be used also to create ER models. Uh, Let us take a look at an example of, of a ER model and see what it consists of. So, this is an example of a library system that we, uh, we had seen during one of the lectures. 
and the library system is a system which basically allows you to search for different articles based on the author, it allows you to search based on the titles, the keywords, the subjects and so on. Um, and, and once it has been, uh, you can search for an article, you can often purchase the article, right. Uh, and the purchasing the article would mean that the authors also had to be credited with a certain amount of uh, royalties um, and so on. So, if we take a look at the, the data needs for such a system, the first thing is you have to represent what an article is going to look like. Right. So, uh, the article is going to have a title to it, it is going to have the set of authors associated with it, right. It could actually have a pointer to where the file is and often associated with each article in the case of our system is going to be a fee, right, that would have to be paid if you are going to end up purchasing the article, right. Um, also there could be the notion of a buyer who is the one who is going to end up buying the article. So, the buyer could have a name, an address and so on. Right. The buyer typically has to end up placing an order for the article. So, we need to be able to represent an entity called an order which will have certain details associated with it. What is the order number, payment details and so on. A buyer, one buyer can end up placing multiple orders and this is illustrated with the 1 to n kind of relationship that exists and this is a places relationship one buyer will end up placing multiple orders and each order can itself be associated with multiple articles, right. Each order can be associated with multiple articles um, and then of course, the, the article might be published in a particular source. So, you can have a published in relationship. And the source could have details of the name of the journal, the name of the publisher, and so on and so forth. Because these are the people to whom the money is going to be credited once the order is placed, and they will in turn have. So, the author would also have to be represented, just like you have the buyer being represented. On one side, you are going to have to represent an author. And in this case, there could be a end to end relationship. What this means to say is that uh, a single author can end up writing multiple articles and a single article can be written by multiple authors and the author would also have things like name, contact information that is address and so on and so forth. Right. So, this is an example of a structural diagram, not, not a complete, the, the, the diagram is not complete. This is something that we can do fairly easily. This is an example of a structural diagram in which uh, we have illustrated the needs from a data perspective of a library system that is going to allow you to search for articles that is going to, remember we say nothing about a search in the data diagram, that is part of the functionality of the system, right. What this is trying to primarily illustrate is what are the data requirements, what are you going to end up storing in a database at the end of the day uh, for such a system. You are going to have to store all the details of the articles, you are going to have to store details about the authors, about the publishers, about orders that come in and so on and so forth. So, this is a semantic data model for a library system, right. And uh, remember just like we had uh, tabular forms of data that can supplement, uh, th that, that can supplement state transition diagrams for example, that it described all the states, it described all the ex external and internal stimuli that this thing can end up responding to, but it gave a descriptive notation of it. Just like we had a diagram, it, it could be complemented with a descriptive notation. Similarly, ER diagrams can be complemented with what is called data dictionaries. And data dictionaries are basically the lists of all the names that are used. For example, uh, in the library system, there was the author, there was the uh, the, the, the purchases relationship, it was a written by relationship between the author and the article, 
um, uh, there, there was the publisher. So, there are different things, there were entities, there were relationships uh, and there were each entity had a certain number of attributes and so on and so forth. And uh, what this basically allows you to do is if you list everything down in a single place, it allows you to for first thing uh, avoid duplication of names. You do not want to have two entities even in two different subsystems which are called by the same name because the database model may end out to be a common model between multiple subsystems of a software uh, application. As a result of which you do not want name duplication, this helps you avoid that and it is also a store of all the organizational knowledge. So, it, it at a glance it gives you what is this entity really trying to represent. What is the relationship really trying to represent? Uh, when was this constructed? By whom was this constructed? So, if I want to, for example, enhance a relationship or enhance an entity with an additional attribute, uh, then you might want to uh, go go back to the author and say, "I'm going to change this. Is it okay?" And so on and so forth. Um, here is an example of a data dictionary, uh, very very uh, concise and uh, it just shows like two or three things relating to the library system that we just talked about. In this case it shows an example of one entity, one attribute and one, uh, one relationship. So, this just gives the name, the data dictionary is typically organized like this, it could have additional columns which represent the author for example. I mean, the, not the author of the table, but the, the person who actually came up with this particular date, data dictionary entry is what we are referring to. Uh, so, the, it says the articles is uh, an entity, it was put in here and uh, the, the details of the, this gives the details of the published article that can be ordered using the Lipsys system. In the case of the author, it is an attribute of the article, uh, it can also be an entity by itself and that can also be stated here that it is both an attribute of an article as well as an entity by itself. Now, the fee payable to is a relationship, it is a one to one relationship between the article and the source um, and, and so on, right. So, this is an example of a data dictionary and the data dictionary is often something that is shared between multiple subsystems within a software application. Um, so, that is as far as the structural details of, uh, of data goes, but often today what is happening is that a lot of the systems that are being built are being constructed in what is called an object oriented technology or a method of development, object oriented method of development and uh, this has its own set of models that it brings into play. So, often instead of starting uh, from the data what object orientation allows us to do is to encapsulate data with the functionality that goes along with the data, right. So, for example, you do not just say that this is an order uh, and the order has these different data fields, but there are things uh, that you can do to an order, right. So, for example, you can create the order, you can enhance the order, you can uh, validate the order, you can check it off that it has been serviced and so on and so forth. So, every um, entity by itself is associated with the state diagram. Remember that it can go through different states and there are different functions that can be performed on it. So, what object models try to do and there are different uh, perspectives of even the object model, but they try to encapsulate or bind together the data and the associated operations that go along with the data, right. Another good example of, of, of an object could be something like um, a camera, right. So, a camera for example has data associated with it, the make, the manufacturer, the kind of lens that it has, the kind of zoom capability it has and so on and so forth. And there are certain things that you can do to it, right. You can, uh, you, you, you can operate the camera, you can uh, change the batteries on the camera, uh, so uh, and so on. So, you can load film into the camera, you can load film, remove film out of the camera and so on and so forth. Um, so, various uh, object models can be produced. Um, an object model very similar to the entity relationship diagram can be produced. In this case, these do not represent data entries, but these represent objects. So, it is a combination of functionality and data in a single entity and almost always most of these object models are associated with a, a de facto standard that has come into place called UML, uh, which is used for modeling uh, object diagrams of various kinds. UML by itself has a uh, it, it's called the unified modeling language and it's a formal description of what we're trying to eventually build you can use uml in the analysis stage and you can use uml in the design stage of of a construction life cycle uh, various object models can be produced and uh, so some of them uh, some of the examples are first of all the the core object model that gives you the different objects and the relationships between the objects 
uh, finally the inheritance model, the aggregation models um, and uh, interaction models which are state transition charts and so on and so forth and message sequence diagrams. We will take a look at some of them during the course of this lecture. Uh, one of the reasons why we are tending to move towards object oriented techniques for construction of software is because they help us reflect more um, naturally on real world constructs. So for example, uh, a real world construct is something that is a combination of the data and the capabilities that can be uh, performed on the data itself um, and this is a, a very good example of that. So a library in, in a library sus subsystem for example, uh, remember we talked about the author, we talked about the order for example. So the order is composed of several different pieces of data, what are the articles that were ordered, uh, what is the cost of each article and so on and so forth. And then the, you can also do things to an order like we talked about. So that is a more natural way of thinking about things and so it is easier to model it using these kinds of constructs and it has become a very, very popular uh, paradigm for constructing software today, right. And uh, the, the hard part in this obviously is recognizing what are objects, what are not objects, uh, what is the granularity of the objects that you uh, end up choosing in uh, building a system and so on and so forth. And uh, it also has gone a long way in helping us build reusable systems or systems from which different piece parts or modules can be reused across multiple subsystems and multiple applications. So uh, what are inheritance models which is uh, the object models are very similar to uh, what we talked about earlier, right. Remember we talked about ER diagrams, object models are very similar to ER diagrams so we are not going to go very much more into that. Uh, but inheritance models essentially allow us to uh, basically specialize the kind of data in a very natural way. Uh, so uh, a good example might be that uh, you have an automobile and an automobile can either be a car or a truck and uh, each one of them have a different set of attributes but we recognize that there is some kind of an order to this whole thing. Right, Let us try to take a look at one such model and see what we mean by this, right. So this is an inheritance model. So we are going to take a, the automobile example first and this is a fairly simplistic example. At the top level everything is an automobile, right. And there are certain characteristics about the automobile, there may be a registration number. which is the most common kind of attribute that can be associated with the automobile. Now the automobile itself can be specialized, right. So for example, you could have different kinds of automobiles. It a, is a kind of relationship that we are trying to represent in this case. Um, it, you can have two wheelers. Just for simplicity's sake, we will just consider four wheelers. Obviously, you can have three wheelers as well, but we will not go there. Four wheelers, right. Now, each one of these has a certain specialization of the general notion of an automobile. In the case of a two wheeler, the number of wheels obviously equals two. Typically, the engines are also fairly simplistic in two wheeled automobiles and so on and so forth. In a four wheeler it is a more complicated uh, mechanism. Now the, the four wheeler I'm, and I am just going to extend this to the next page, we will we'll assume by starting that we uh, starting at the four wheeler point can be further specialized, right. So you can have for example a car or a truck, both are four wheelers. And each one of these may have certain characteristics to it, right. The truck for example could be characterized by the amount of payload that it can carry because it is mainly meant to transport goods. But the car on the other hand can be characterized by the number of passengers it is going to carry, right, because it is a car, it is mainly meant to transport people, it is not meant to transport goods. So the truck is characterized by a different set of attributes, payload in this case to just to take an example and the car is characterized by a different set of attributes which is number of passengers. So this is an example of specialization. What this really means to show is that the car 
inherits and this notation, this triangular notation is used to depict inheritance in UML. Uh, this car inherits all the attributes and the functionality that a four wheeler represents which is a very general notion of what a truck or a car could be right. And uh, the, the, the four wheeler represents a general notion it is associated with certain attributes associated with it and remember our example the four wheeler inherited from the general notion of automobile as a result of which uh, we could uh, we inherited all the functionality from the automobile as well. So, inheritance is a way of specialization and generalization and that is what this goes to illustrate and this helps us reuse this. So, for example, if you are today building a system that handles car registration and it is a car registration system, uh, you simply specialize the four wheeler to say it is a car and you are done at that point in time. But tomorrow if you wanted to extend the same thing to cover trucks, you can specialize that by creating a truck category uh, and that inherits everything that was above it, but that might add certain attributes, might add certain functionality to itself, right. So, that is uh, the, the example of uh, uh, class hierarchies. Uh, we can also have the notion of what is called multiple inheritance. So, single inheritance may, may mainly was that I am going to inherit or specialize a, a one class that is above me or one class of entities that is above me, but multiple inheritance says that I want to inherit the attributes of class A and class B and this can lead to several problems as well even though the expressive power of something like this is obviously great. Um, here is an example uh, of saying uh, we, we, we want a talking book. Right. A talking book is nothing but a number of uh, tapes that is associated with it, but a talking book inherits from a book which was the old notion of what a book is which is a paper and uh, you know which is a paper model of a book um, and the notion of a voice recording which, which shows a speaker duration and so on. A talking book ends up inheriting from both of these um, uh, basic classes to create a specialized class. So, this is an example of what is called multiple inheritance. It has a, a lot of semantic conflicts that it ends up as, uh, getting uh, associated with it. So, uh, you have to be very careful about when you end up using multiple inheritance, how it is used and whether it is absolutely required uh, to use something like this. Now, aggregation models are something that do not show inheritance per se, but they are focused on showing the part of or whole relationship. Right. So, there are different kinds of relationship and there are different notations in UML for expressing these relationships. So, in uh, entity relationships simply show a generalized relationship between two kinds of entities in an object model. Um, in the case of the inheritance relationship, it shows the is, um, uh, is a relationship or a specialization generalization relationship. Um, aggregation shows a part of or whole relationship. So, for example, house is composed of a dining room, a kitchen, a living room and so on and so forth. Um, so, aggregation models try to show what is composed of what um, and can also be a part of an interesting data model. Again, here is an example of something uh, which is an aggregation model. It shows that there is something called a study pack that, that, that can be sold for example relating to a course. A study pack consists of lecture notes, it consists of videotape presentations, it consists of slides, it consists of assignments and so on. And an assignment in this particular case consists of exercises, solutions and so on and so forth. So, it is trying to build up the notion of there are different piece parts and a, a larger entity which is a coarser grained entity is a combination of the different piece parts that can exist. Um, behavioral models for objects essentially show uh, are what are called me message sequence charts and we saw an example of this um, earlier they show the different transitions that can a, that can exist in response to an external stimuli that occurs in the system. I am quickly going to draw an example of a message sequence chart uh, represented as MSC in this case um, and we will show an example of the ATM process right. So, here is an automatic teller machine. So, the different entities here are user, ATM, uh, maybe the security subsystem that can exist and so on and so forth. So, the user for example can end up inserting a card to an ATM and the ATM now it, the message sequence start as the name conveys is a sequence of messages that occurs in, re, in reaction to this insert card message that was first sent by the user to the ATM. The ATM may immediately read the card 
and then this axis is that of time. I may read the card, go to a security module, say verify card. The security may come back and say verified. And the ATM might now give choices to the user like withdrawal choices, deposit choices and so on and so forth. Right? So here is a quick example of object behavioral modeling so to speak. What this is, is it is called a message sequence chart and it allows us to look at a sequence of interactions between the different modules of the system that, that can exist. So what we have seen today is essentially a set of structured methods. Uh, that allow us to model different aspects of the systems as we go along all the way from the requirements engineering stage through the analysis and the design stages. So some of these models are used all the way in the requirement stage. So for example, the notion of use cases which is very, very uh, commonly used in UML is used to model requirements um, and uh, the, the user also is involved in putting together use cases. Um, and then there can be uh, things like message sequence charts which are really used to model designs because they are modeling object behavior. Uh, they give us certain notations, concise notations that allow us to very clearly state uh, what is it that uh, the, the system is going to do at the end of the day. Um, and a lot of the case tools, the, the IDEs for example, the uh, interactive development environments that exist help us model these things. There, there are different tools that exist to create these different notational models, to verify the models, to generate code from these models and so on. So that a large amount of work is essentially spent in modeling as opposed to actually writing the code because models are easier to read, they are easier to verify, they are open to actually machine verification techniques um, as we shall see in formal specification lectures in this course um, and that gives us a tremendous advantage because if a machine can verify the correctness and the completeness of a model uh, then it can give you a handle on where the errors lie and you can just focus on, on modeling in the abstract and then let something generate the code for you. So the disadvantages of structured methods are obviously that they could end up generating a lot of documentation which does not get used very often, uh, but that really is up to the designers and the builders of the system itself. Um, and uh, you have to be careful in how you use the expressive power that is given to you by some of these modeling paradigms and modeling tools. Um, as long as you are actually carrying through a thread of continuity all the way from requirements through design and implementation, uh, the modeling uh, turns out to be very, very useful and powerful. Uh, but if, if you are going to break it off, for example, if you are going to do requirements modeling using use cases and then have a human read it, turn around and translate it into English into a specification, have another human read the specification, then turn around and write a design on paper, then this process does not is not of much use. It just ends up generating a lot of documentation at the end of the day. Um, so uh, be careful in how you use the expressive power of these things. We have seen certain examples, again this is a very high level talk of this whole uh, idea of systems modeling. We will go into the details of where the, mo what are the important models and how they are going to be used in the next few lectures of this course.